تمام يا باشمهندس ممكن نبدا تمام اوكي شو راي ستارت شيرينج او ستارت الليكتشر احنا لايف دلوقتي ممكن نبدا اوكي Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, so, today's lecture will be about uh, housing, about adequate housing, in particular, speaking about uh, adequacy and uh, affordability of housing. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Hussam Hussain, Dr. Hussam Hussain. I am a doctor assistant professor at the uh, German University in Cairo. I also am a head of uh, design unit and director of research studies in uh, the REC, Riyadh Engineering Center in Jordan. Uh, I'm the editor on, in, in chief of uh, the Journal of Mediterranean Cities. And in front of you, I have also uh my contact information some links uh that uh, i'm hoping that it would be of uh, uh would be beneficial for you i would be very glad if you reach out to me for any questions even through email uh later on um but today also i would also uh, welcome questions after the lecture uh hopefully it will not take more than one hour but in fact housing is is a very very large field. So one lecture is not enough. This is why we, we have designed a series of two lectures. Uh, and if needed to go more than two lectures, uh, uh, I welcome that. I'm happy to, to support. But um, I mean, I teach housing for the past years. And uh, usually, it takes me not less than 14 to 15 lectures in order to uh, deliver all the information needed to understand it. So affordability or adequate housing uh, is a principle in, in housing in general. And in order to understand affordability or adequate housing, we need to go through several principles and factors. So today's lecture will be more of uh, delivering to you the factors, giving you some, some important aspects related to housing. Uh, to understand what housing is, to understand the notion of housing of, of housing in general. Uh, there are so many things to, to talk about, and at the end, we would, uh, we would uh, arrive to speak about the affordability and adequate housing. Um, we, I think the first thing we, we, we get or comes to mind when speaking about housing is the meaning of home. What is home and what is the difference between home and housing? What is the difference between house and home or space and place in general? Um, is this, for example, a home? This is a question only to all of us. Is this a home? Is this what I consider a home? These are images from, uh, from Egypt. Is this a home? So where do we actually live? Are these spaces, intermediate spaces between the shelters in general considered also part of our houses or our homes? What about these ones? What about these kind of spaces? What about the interior spaces in general? Are they part of our homes? Who designed these spaces? Are architects or, or uh, interior designers involved in the design or is it designed by the social behavior or everyday behavior of the residents and inhabitants themselves. This is another image to question. This is uh, the project of uh, Le Caposer. What do we consider home? I mean, living in slums or in a planned city or even in a very dense overpopulated areas as such. But when we see such images, this, this is uh, an image from the earthquake uh, last year in Turkey. We start really to question the meaning of a house or home or the place where we belong. 
uh, who really needs house? Who really needs to, to be accommodated? Um, I mean, at the end, okay, there are a lot of associations and institutes uh, and organizations and non uh, organi and, and NGOs also working to provide shelters. But we really need to, to understand and uh, sometimes question the meaning of a house and who really requires this service. And at the middle of everything, we are always lost uh, between different classes, upper classes, middle classes, lower classes. I mean, a house is a house at the end. Everyone has the, the uh, requirements uh, for their own, uh, you know, everyday life in a house or in a home. Um, and the qualities uh, depend also on the social level of the people. But at the end, it's it's like a it's like a pyramid, and just here I don't know if you see the screen. Just if you if you put several pyramids next to each other, this integrated part is where we can actually define affordability or adequate housing or decent housing. So the question really is, what is housing? And what are the, the, the factors which define housing? There are a lot of challenges, crises, and potentials for housing. We need to understand the evolution of housing. We need to understand the typologies. We need to understand the forms. We need to understand the transformation of uh, houses and the transition of people understanding housing in general. We need to understand the densities at different areas. We need to understand the policies, we need to understand economics, social factors, and cultural values, and how people adapt to these spaces. So there are three main pillars here to understand housing. We need to understand the context at which the housing is being designed. For example, Cairo, for example, Beirut, uh, Amman, or Berlin, or Munich, or some city in the uh, uh, USA or any other city in the world, we have to understand the characteristics of the space. And then we need to question the principles of the housing which need to be adapted in this space. And at the end, we do our reflections. And all of these pillars must go through the participatory approach where people themselves have to also inject their own principles in that. And this is overall, uh, the meaning of affordability, which we will try to, to achieve at the end of the series, the, the two lectures, the, the series of, of lectures. Uh, mainly, I mean, our main part that we will try to, uh, at the end, comprehend is this uh, middle part, the principles. There are principles given by the housing federations around the world, for example, accessibility to housing, affordability, uh, um, um, you know, adequacy and so on. But these are only general principles that we deal with. And there are very specific principles that we need to integrate in our projects in order to make it context aware. And this is our own reflection at the end. Um, so for, for example, speaking about Cairo, People attending this lecture from, from Cairo know the situation in Cairo. They know, they know the difference between uh, someone living in uh, uh, a gated community, for example, or a new city uh, in Tagamma, for example, and someone living in uh, one of the informal areas. Uh, probably they both have uh, the qualities they're uh, searching for or they're seeking in life in general. They are different, but they are, uh, let's say, convinced with these qualities. Uh, but what is the meaning of accessibility for someone uh, who's living on, on a daily basis income? And what is the difference between that and someone who's uh, living on annual income of millions? Yeah, so of course I'm not criticizing, but what I'm saying is that we need to, to put everything in place. We need to uh, reflect on the adequate housing 
principles in general. We need to make it more context aware. We need to understand where the housing is being built and accordingly adapt. What we all agree on at the end is housing is for all. Whether uh, I am from, from um, the, low, the lowest uh, uh, social class of the community or the highest, at the end, we all deserve housing. Housing is a right for everyone. Housing is part of the infrastructural facilities, by the way. In the same way is, uh, is that football uh, for all. Housing is for all. In the same way as also football is for all. Everyone have the right to watch football. If we put football and housing, that equals conflict. And let me explain. That me, my, might be a very sarcastic way of uh, understanding the, the situation, but probably this is the simplest way also to understand it. Um, Housing and football are fundamental cornerstones of Egyptian life. Everyone watches football. Either you're a supporter of Ahli or Zamalek or whatever, everyone supports uh, a team or a club. And also everyone has the right to have a house. Both housing and football, they can both make or break marriage proposals. And they both can slow down the economy or boost the economy. In front of us, Aravena. And in both cases, they actually really have a big influence on social life. So housing is really social. Housing is about money. Housing is also political. If we look now at numbers and try to understand the population rates in the Middle East in the 20th century, the population rate was about 39%. In the 21st century, in the developing countries of the, Mid of the Middle East, uh, around 1.5 billion people were living in urban areas or will be living in urban areas by, two, uh, by 2024, so by next year. Population of urban areas all over the world exceeds 50%. So if we are now about uh, eight or, or nine billion around the world, as I think uh, half that lives in urban areas and the number is projected to increase uh, by 20 or percent in the coming 25 years. And this is a big number. And this, is, this has a big influence of, on, on cities, either slums, informals, or even the planned cities. And accordingly, we can say that the planning of, of housing is the mirror of the social classes. Al-Amran mir'alit abawat al-tabaqi fi al-mujtama'at. This is why uh, organizations such as the UN uh, and many others, they uh, developed uh, uh, different strategies to deal with this problem. Uh, but it's always very specific. For example, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, and so on. Even other organizations such as the UFM, the Union for Mediterranean, who developed uh, different researches related to uh, housing, dwelling, heritage, protection, and so on. It's always very specific towards a certain agenda, and it never takes into consideration a particular context, it does not really respect the characteristics and qualities and requirements of a particular context. Looking at Cairo, for example, this is a map of Cairo in the 1982, and the development of uh, the urban area of, of Cairo over time, and we can see how, it is, how the development and the growth is taking over uh, the desert and, and lands and even agricultural lands, and this is in 2007. So, and this is uh, the, the current situation, more or less. And uh, putting this into statistics and numbers, the population um, uh, development in Egypt since the 1960, we can see that between the 80s and 2005, the number of population, the rate of population has doubled only in these 40 years from around 35 to around 70 million people. 
And this is a scary number in only 40 years. And the problem is that it is also projected to be doubled again within the 25 coming years. So within 40 years, it doubled from 35 to 70, and it's going to double again from 70 to about uh, uh, 110 uh, within the coming 20, 25 years. So we are speaking about a real crisis and population is directly related to housing because the more people we have, the more housing that we need to provide for them. It's a real challenge and crisis. In Egypt in particular, now uh, the population is over 100 million people overall in Egypt. And the growing rate is uh, about 2% uh, uh, every year. So it's increasing by 2% every year. So if, the, if, the, if this year it increased to next and the, the, the and it will be 102 million, the, the, the next time it will be one, the next year will be 104, the, the one after it and so on. So this is again, a very scary number. And that's why housing is becoming a top priority on the local agenda in Egypt. And this is why we have a lot of projects. And this is why we have always news that we need more units, we need more units, we need more units. And according to this news, uh, uh, Egypt should provide around 500,000 units every year, extra every year. Yeah. So this year we need extra half a million units. The next one we need 1 million and the next we 1.5 and so on because uh, the, grow, the, the, the population grow is growing rapidly and we have to adapt to that. And this is why the new cities are becoming the new trend. So it is a logical uh, consequence of this uh, uh, projected numbers that we see. On the other side, looking at the, uh, the housing vacancy on Egypt, there are really uh, you know, numbers that we cannot understand. Uh, in front of us, according to campus, we can see different uh, governorates, Cairo, Alexandria, Helwan, 6th of October, City, uh, Minofia, Giza. In blue, we can see the occupied number of, uh, uh, of houses, of residential units. And in green, we can see the vacant ones. So these are existing vacant units. So if we re really have a problem in, in, in uh, the accommodation, problem in the number of units, so where are these vacant lands coming from? Why are there vacant uh, uh, sorry units in the first place? Why not to use them? What is happening to these 35% uh, of the units in Giza are vacant? 29% of the units overall in Cairo are vacant. In Alexandria, 38% are vacant. So we're speaking um, of an average of about one third of the units in Egypt are vacant. Um, again, between 2006 and 2017, we can see the housing units uh, uh, vacancy and we can see that there are a lot of units that are vacant, around 33 Point one million units are vacant in Egypt, where Egypt uh, were vacant in Egypt between 2006 and, and 17. So what really happened? Do did people upgrade, for example, to better houses and lift their old houses, or is it the problem of, for example, illegal adim, or what is the real problem? I mean, there is a problem that is not really uh, uh, understandable here and we need to analyze it and we need to understand what is happening to these vacant houses. And this is only one of the aspects. What I'm trying to do until now is to uh, take you out or take from your brains the concept of housing being a single structure. Housing is not a structure. Housing is not one single building. Uh, uh, housing is not an apartment building with, for example, eight uh, uh, units. Housing is not a villa in New Cairo. This is not housing. These are only tools. These are only places we live in. Housing is beyond that. Housing has a lot of aspects and factors that we need to understand in order to solve a real serious problem. At the same time, 
if we look at the rates of rental versus ownership between the 86, 1986 and 2017, uh, according to news, 89% of Egyptian people cannot afford to buy uh, uh, units or properties without a support from the government. And this number is increasing. What is he really here shocking is uh, these two numbers. The average of increase in the uh, uh, monthly salary or income of people is about 200. And the average increase of properties is 400. So it's, it's double. You know, it's double the income, uh, the, the growth of the uh, prices of apartments or rent of apartments is uh, growing in the double ratio of the uh, monthly or yearly income of people. And this is another crisis again. Here again, reflecting on these uh, numbers, rent against income, we can find uh, the same uh, results. If we see the trend of renting against the ownership, also again, we find the same uh, uh, problem. People are owning apartments. Here we can see that the owned apartments is increasing, but the rental apartments are decreasing over the years. So what is really happening? I mean, this proposes only two things to my mind. It's either rich people are really getting richer, or pure people are getting poorer. And this is the only hypothesis I have in mind uh, so far. I mean, now speaking to you or discussing these matters to you mm -hmm. and trying to analyze or understand uh, uh, these numbers that we have in front of us in a critical way uh, and putting these numbers or ratios or uh, you know statistics uh, before our eyes, what we can analyze is really there is something um, that we cannot really comprehend. And this is why uh, the government has proposed so many different social housing programs over the year, over the past years. Um, again, Shua Iskandar, 2023, this is the last one I've seen. The problem here really, I mean, if you go through um, this news, I go this through the, through this news sometimes, and I go even further to to read the uh, requirements and so on. And uh, um, the part that uh, yeah, you know uh, grabs the attention the most when you read is that here it says, I mean, regarding the prices as a two thousand twenty three only this year. تبدأ أسعار وحدات سكنية إسكان الشباب من 168,000 pounds for the single unit to going up to 270,000 pounds. And one of the conditions is that ألا يزيد الدخل الشهري المتقدم عن 3,500 pounds. Believe me, so many people uh, are getting less than uh, 3,500 pounds. So that means only one thing. The affordable housing is not an, any more affordable in, in Egypt. Of course, this is due to uh, several circumstances. Uh, there is global agendas, there is global economic crisis, the wars in the northern part of the world, uh, and so many other things. And taking the rate of poverty in, in Egypt, which is about 30% of Egypt, uh, of the population in Egypt, so P Egypt is about uh, 100 million, around 33 million people are considered poor. And if I'm one of these people, I would rather uh, buy uh, uh, my daily needs uh, rather than buying an apartment. Here in front of us, uh, news or the, the numbers of uh, some goods, daily things uh, like rice or food or B or Z uh, from the same website at two different times. This was taken a few months ago and this was taken only today on the left side. And we can see the increase of numbers. So for example, this was uh, three, four months ago about uh, now it's now it's 
So what I'm saying is uh, the sustainability or stability of, uh, of people everyday life is not there. So I would make, you know, Hamil Hisab Bukra regarding these increasing uh, numbers that we see every day, rather than um, rather than buying an apartment for even if it's only 200 or 300,000 pounds. Maybe I own, if I'm in from the lower uh, class of the community, I would only uh, need my daily, uh, my daily goods, my daily food to buy, nothing more. So at the same time, there are more and more social uh, housing programs, but now uh, developers and investors appeared after the, uh, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. And it was seen as a potential rather than um, a need, you know? So it was seen by the investors as a potential on another level and were not, they're not to be blamed by the way. Uh, but the problem is that housing uh, became uh, a commodity instead of being a need and a right. Um, and this is due to, to, to a vision. So this uh, picture in front of us, this satellite image is Cairo in, I think in the nineties or so, where we can see that the population is growing towards uh, this area. It was growing towards the Ismailia alongside with the agricultural lands, but uh, now it's more growing towards Swiss city. You know, so it's stretching towards this area. And this is due to global agendas. I mean, Suez City is a very, uh, or Suez Canal in general, is a very important uh, uh, factor. It's a very important element. It's a very important uh, aspect of, uh, or resource and source for Egypt. And this is why the new capital and so many other cities are growing towards, uh, you know, Suez, Al Bahr Al Ahmar, and so on. Um, and over 44 new cities appeared uh, uh, over the past 20, 30 years. Uh, and uh, of course, we can uh, conclude that with more money, a rapid response, you know, appears. Um, and here are the, the uh, 44 different cities. And you can see the proximity from Cairo, and we can see overall the development or the planning, the strategic planning of these cities along the Egypt in general. And here we're speaking about the image of modern versus the old. These are uh, the image of the modern city and we need to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, adapt to the, to the new trends and changes of the world. But at the same time, we have uh, uh, the old vision or the old structure of the city, the informals or not informals, the old uh, structure in the city uh, in general. And as, as a result of all of this, uh, the gap between the social classes is increasing. The old cities or the old areas are relatively ignored uh, uh, against the new cities. And the new cities are considering the higher classes of the community. And um, the result of course would influence both because um, as we presented before, the, uh, the prices of the units and the rents are increasing and the uh, wages are, you know, decreasing or stable. And also another consequence of this uh, is related to uh, the infrastructure or to the property or the density of the areas. And this is the central area of uh, Cairo. Uh, where we can see the, the number of uh, poor population, you know, living in these central spaces, we can see where is the most dense areas that really requires immediate actions, you know, to save. And we can see the poverty rates and it's all away, so much away from the uh, new cities. We can even see per capita, the share uh, yearly from the local development programs uh, uh, regarding the budget uh, compared to the level of poverty. And uh, of course, the, the poverty uh, is in red and we can see the share in green. Yeah, so we can see, for example, Masri Giria is taking more than 
uh, much more in terms of uh, ratio against the uh, you know no civil third beginning um, than Helwan or Shobra or Masabirida or Manshid um, Nasser or Sharabia and so on. So here we are speaking about the problem of accessibility. And accessibility is one of the principles and factors of affordable housing. Accessibility to what? Accessibility to, uh, for example, uh, toilets or you know, waste management or uh, drainage systems or infrastructure facilities in general. And we can see that people who uh, have uh, uh, toilets, private toilets inside their homes, in some areas, it's 0%. In some areas, is 100%. Um, so the distribution of these uh, facilities are really um, not uh, equal. Again, we can see that a lot of areas are not connected at all. And at the end, we can find even in the new cities, urban voids, we can see a lot of voids, even in the image of the new city. Yeah, so looking at, for example, this, uh, this is New Cairo, and looking at this uh, particular area, for example, this is a compound. Yeah, while this is an open area, and this is a gated compound, and this is a neighborhood, you know, a normal neighborhood, and we can see the difference in uh, uh, the maintenance of the lands and the accessibility to green areas between two neighboring neighborhoods. And uh, this results, of course, in uh, incomplete construction and waste of resources. And this is what we uh, see also in New Cairo as a modern city. A lot of voids, a lot of uh, empty vacant uh, houses, a lot of uh, vacant uh, big large lands with no uh, function or use. Um, a huge roundabouts for uh, uh, no reason, only to connect uh, cars and cities or districts together by cars. So it's becoming more of uh, more and more of uh, a car oriented cities as a result. The question really that pops up is related to the old cities. So with these new cities in general, what happens to, to the old structures? How to plan new ones and how to deal? Do we really uh, need to force or to upgrade the old uh, uh, structures? Or do we need to force new uh, strategies in order to accommodate the, um, the growing population? And this is, by the way, it's a very critical question and not easy to answer. I mean, of course, we have to deal with the, with the growing population, the rapid one, but at the same time, we have a lot of areas that need upgrades and the resources are limited. The funds or the budget is also very limited. So this is a very critical, um, uh, very critical aspect uh, that, that Egypt needs to, to deal with. And this is not only in Egypt, this is in so many other countries and cities similar in scale and population around the world. Um, but in either way, the social gap will keep stretching more and more. And this is the real problem. And we can see in these examples how in some areas even there is encroachment on agricultural lands. So the, the, uh, the houses or the uh, urban area or the inhabited area is eating the agricultural lands. And this is another problem because now uh, uh, the less rural areas we have in, uh, in Egypt in general, that means more internal migration will uh, you know, increase in the coming years because people will migrate from rural, rural areas or agricultural areas which are disappearing, searching for other opportunities, job opportunities elsewhere. And this is concentrating the, um, the population uh, in the uh, central area of Cairo more and more and affecting as a result, the overall quality of life. And we can, of course, most of us who have seen a lot of these uh, scenes in front of us in the, in the houses, we can see how the intermediate species are dealt with in some areas and even some lands are becoming uh, 
uh, lands for uh, throwing the garbage and so on. But surprisingly, this kind of voids, they're not only appearing in the informal or the old structures or, you know, in the agricultural lands or the rural areas or the, you know, uh, the spaces for uh, uh, where uh, lower social classes are uh, uh, living, but it's also appearing in new cities. For example, again, this is in New Cairo. This is near the uh, AUC, the American University in Cairo. I've taken this satellite image only a few months ago, and I started counting the compounds in this area. And I found that over 70 to 80% of the area are compounds, gated compounds, yeah? So uh, I think this is here, Palm Hills, this is uh, Zizinia. Uh, here is the uh, Scanel AUC. Uh, so most of these areas highlighted in red are gated communities. The problem appears here is, is, I mean, the consequence of these gated communities is the effect of these walls, let's say, on the intermediate or the public spaces. So the planning of this area or this neighborhood uh, uh, was designed to provide a central public space, a central green area. Same here. This is a big neighborhood. This is a block, a big block. And again, in the center area was supposed to be a green space. Here again, this is a big block. And we can see in the middle, again, there was supposed to be a green space. Again, here, the same situation. So what is really happening? I mean, looking at here, I think this is another compound, but it's a big compound. We can see green areas. Here, we can see green areas. So what is really happening in these areas? Let's focus or zoom in on, on, on one of these uh, areas and try to understand what is happening to this. Basically, there is no access to this land. There is no access to this green area. For example, taking this very little neighborhood here, we can see it's maybe not really, really very well maintained, but we can see uh, you know, traces of uh, green public spaces in the middle. And the reason is that houses or buildings have direct access to this space. So it, it is uh, somewhat maintained either by the Bawa Beam, probably the, uh, um, or the people themselves. But of course, how can, we, how can we maintain or keep this green if it's surrounded by walls? And there is no access point whatsoever to this land. Each of these little compounds have their own green spaces, uh, what is, which is gated, and it's a private one for the people living in this area. Again, and for people living in this area. So we are left as a result with uh, a vacant land with no green, no public spaces, no maintenance at all. And this has a larger effect overall on Egypt. If we look at the most, at the 10, most populated polluted cities in, in, in the world, we can see that uh, the score of Egypt is number one, ranked number one with score 95 uh, uh, on the world, you know, so it's the most populated city, a polluted city on the world. And we can see this if you go, for example, in the morning in, uh, you know, in spring, in the morning going from Giza to, to Cairo, crossing one of the bridges, in the morning, I mean, uh, after sunrise or at sunrise around 5.36, we can, you can see this uh, black cloud in, in, in the sky. So the accessibility to housing uh, is a real problem. And that results as, as a result, uh, this results in, in accessibility to water or might affect also the accessibility to energy and so on. Housing as a structure is only a tool, as I mentioned, we need to understand so many things beyond that. We need to understand the, uh, that the population growth is not really the problem. Uh, the the uh, strategy towards that is the real problem. The economic actions and visions much, much prioritize the crisis more. As, as Jane Jacobs say, there is no logic that can be uh, superimposed on, or imposed on the city. People make the city and it is uh, to them 
not buildings that we must fit our plans. Here it is to say that, I mean, we need to, to uh, uh, involve people in the uh, design of the cities. Again, Richard Fuller says, when I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty. I think only how to solve the problem. But when I have finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it's not working. So I ask myself a question. I ask everyone this question. How will the future of cities look like? How should our planning strategies be and how can we adapt to the changes over the world? Despite its frame pace in the international human rights housing has lost its currency as a human right in general. The right to decent housing is uh, lost. And speaking about commodification versus affordability, we will find that uh, housing, uh, decent housing is not the uh, uh, center of uh, visions uh, anymore. I mean, speaking about uh, a global vision, of course. And uh, here we come to the, probably the link a bit to the affordability. Um, having understood all of these aspects in general, all over the world, which is being faced with cities all over the world, we need to understand the um, the overall demand and supply of housing. Uh, I mean, affordability lies be, be, be between uh, supply and demand. It's, it lies between the family income and the housing production cost. It lies between the family purchasing capacity against the dwelling price. And at the end, the monthly uh, housing uh, 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 repayment or rent against the monthly housing uh, rent is the real link to affordability. This is to say that uh, the demand and supply of, of housing must always uh, be matched, must always uh, uh, be, uh, uh, you know, um, going in parallel, understood as part and in parallel, being studied and uh, uh, presented in parallel. And um, in order to define the approach of affordability in Egypt, we need to understand the role of local visions. And in order to do that, we need really to understand densities. And this is a very important principle or uh, uh, factor of housing. What is really density? What is density in general? Or what is compactness? Or what is diversity? Let me ask myself a question and ask you all a question. Uh, unfortunately, you are not here with me uh, directly, but through an online uh, uh, streaming. So if I ask you, where is the most dense area on, of, in the world between these three cities? Is it Bangladesh? Is it Lebanon? Is it China? I asked this question always to my students and the answer was always China. Okay, let's look at the scale of the cities. Let's look at the uh, size of the land. This is Bangladesh. This is Lebanon. Of course, I'm putting them to scale, yeah? So they are um, proportionally correct. So A is Bangladesh, B is Lebanon, and three is China. And we can see the size of the land of China next to Lebanon or next to Bangladesh. It's a huge land. It occupies a large portion of land. And this is why my students always answer with China. Of course, it's a big land. Well, let's try to understand densities in another world. This is Egypt and this is Lebanon. Lebanon and Egypt, and we can see the different, uh, the, 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 the huge difference in size and scale between both. So this is Egypt and this is Lebanon. Do you know how many Lebanons can fit inside Egypt? Well, let's do this little test. These are 
you know, proportionally correct. We kept going. Yeah, we keep going till reaching to 100 Lebanons fitting inside Egypt. Egypt could easily contain 100 Lebanons. Let's have another example. This is Qatar and this is Namibia. You can look at them on Google Earth or Google Maps. And this is the area of both countries. One, Qatar is 11,000 kilometers squares. Uh, Namibia is 824,000 kilometer squares. They are both same in population. Either the Sukkan is the same. Either the Sukkan, Hoa Hoa, Abin Qatar, and Namibia. But the size is different. This is to say that density is related to the distribution of people in a certain area. Let's repeat again. Density is related to the distribution distribution of people in a certain area. It's not related to the area of the country. distribution in the area. This is another example. This is Qatar and this is Saudi Arabia. Qatar, Saudi. Qatar is around 11,000 kilometers square, the area. But Saudi is 2 million kilometers square. So Saudi can contain 185 Qatars. 185 Qatar ka area. 185 min Qatar mumkin yigi ifit goa Saudi. But looking at the number of inhabitants or Adad Sukan, we can find in Qatar 2.7 million, while 36 million inhabitants are in Saudi Arabia. So doing, I mean, and graphically only trying to understand, okay, how can we fit 2.7 million people in 11,000 kilometers square? Let's do it graphically, yeah? These are 2.7 million people inside 11,000 kilometers square. While if we want to do that in Saudi Arabia, you can see that the dots, the, the distance, the masafa mabain, not the dots, it's, it's bigger. Why? Because the land is bigger. You know, so the crowdness is zahma, the goa Qatar is more even though Saudi Akbar Bakhtir. And putting both Saudi and Qatar next to each other, we can simply understand that Qatar is more dense than Saudi Arabia. And the ratio is one to 13 in terms of numbers. So the question is, which is more dense, Qatar or Saudi Arabia? The answer is clearly Qatar. Anyway, in order to uh, calculate the density as now we understand what is the meaning of density, distribution of people in the area. So density equals to total population divided by the total area. As an example, in Qatar and Saudi Arabia, the density is 2,700,000 uh, million million divided by 11,000. This is the area which equals to 234 persons per kilometer square. While in Saudi Arabia, the number would be 18 person per kilometer square, which means, which means, mitin warba utalatin shakhs aishin fi one kilometer square. Fi Saudi, 18, bas tamantashar wahid mumkin iskun fi one kilometer square. Why? Because the, the land is bigger. So the ratio between the land area and the population, the number of people in that area, the ratio is bigger. And this is why we can, we can see that less people live in the same area than Qatar. So now we get back to our question. 
Where is the most dense area in the world? Bangladesh, Lebanon, or China? Let's ask ourselves the question. I mean, we have the formula, so let's try to answer it. In Bangladesh, there are 170 million people. In Lebanon, there are only 5.5 million people. In China, there are 1.4 billion people. But the area of these three cities or these three countries are, of course, reflecting different realities. So in Bangladesh, it's a very small country. Lebanon is even smaller. And China is very, very big. Yeah. So doing the calculations, we can find that in Bangladesh, uh, per kilometer square. In Lebanon, per kilometer square. In China, 174 people per kilometer square. Yes, 174 is a big number of people living in kilometer square, but it's even more. Can you imagine 1,150 people living in kilometer square? So the answer to this question is Bangladesh is the most dense area of the world. Lebanon, this very small, cute country, is number two because of the number of people uh, against the area, the small area. And China is far from that. It's number 56. Uh, I think it's up to you now to calculate also if you're from Egypt or from any country to calculate the density of your own country and then reflect these densities on the realities of housing and providing housing uh, uh, projects or programs or units in your country. And you can even understand the number of units that you need. Yeah. So in brief, what is density? What is considered high density? High density is the large number of inhabitants per kilometer square. What about Egypt? Egypt is, uh, the density of Egypt is uh, uh, 112 inhabitants per kilometer square. And we can see that the problem is probably people living or us, some people, other people living in new cities or less crowded cities, they don't realize these kind of numbers. Um, and the, the, the problem here is related to the uh, government or municipal border, yeah? So the problem is related to the distribution of inhabitants. It is related to the distribution of housing units. This is the border of the government of Cairo. If you just search on Google Earth, write uh, Cairo governorate, you can find that more or less probably, um, not, it's not very accurate, but more or less, this is the municipal border. Yeah. But we know that the Cairo is very, very dense. It's very populated. So why only, it, the number says only 100, and 12, where are the people? Where are the 30 million, 40 million? I don't know how many people are living in Cairo. Where are they? You know, The problem of density is that is uh, divided by in the local or the government agendas. It's always divided by the, municipal, the, the area of the municipal border, not the area of the actual inhabited area. So, what I mean is, in all of this area, probably mumkin yikun aish fi al-Qahira 25 million. Let's say 25 million shakhs, yeah? But when we calculate the density, these 25 million shakhs are divided by the overall land of the municipal border, not by this area where they are actually living. And this is why the number or the density is lower than we expect. But if we are to uh, uh, calculate the density of all of the people living in Cairo, divided by the area, the land area of the actual inhabited area, uh, um, urban area, the density will be much more larger. Another concept is diversity, which is uh, directly related to uh, 
directly to related to to uh, to the density the more defined border the more diversity we will have yeah so the more defined the more diverse diversity could be in people ethnicity it could be in the culture it could be related to buildings typologies or morphologies it could be related to functions it could be related to services or religion of people uh, or the height of buildings or typologies or anything yeah so getting back to the, the the example of qatar and saudi arabia which in your opinion is more diverse qatar or saudi arabia let's put diversity in different colors yeah let's represent let's numassil a diversity in different cut in different uh, colors which in your opinion now is more diverse is it Saudi Arabia or is it Qatar? The ratio between the distribution and land area might be the same in each of these two countries. Yeah, but it is more noticeable in connected areas. So it tanawa it biban oktor fil amakin illi connected oktor. Yeah which is more connected between these two uh, uh, countries, Qatar or Saudi Arabia. It's clear, we can say that Qatar is more connected while and the dots which represent diversity or population or whatever are more connected, they are more close together. Yeah, so the more connected, the more noticeable, diversity Oktor. yeah. So the more distribution, the less segregation at the same time. Speaking of segregation, let's redistribute this diversity in another way. Again, probably here we have the same number of green dots than uh, as the previous one. We have the same number of uh, black or blue or yellow dots, but now they are combined together in Qatar and in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So now which is more diverse? Here some characteristics has changed. We can say that the less distribution of the diverse community equals to more segregation. So still and then a tanawa. This someone would it tanawa. Yeah. This someone would a diversity is still there but it is concentrated or it's distributed in unequal way or distances or not really connected in equal way between one and another so the result is the the, the less distribution of these diverse elements the more segregation appears so فصل أكثر ما بين التنوع لأنها متجمعة على بعض. Yeah. And the result of this is a centered-based neighborhoods. Yeah. And um, this has influence on social economic uh, segregation. So now each of these parts are becoming independent more and more each of these although the country overall is diverse but we can see that it's grouped you know each uh, whatever even if they are people or different nationalities living in the same place they are grouped yeah and they are self-centered around themselves so the less dependency also equals to economic segregation I think we can again go to one of the examples and relate somehow to the compounds in Egypt. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, diversity in terms of typologies, in terms of uh, fabrics, in terms of uh, distribution of people or population or densities in different spaces. But again, they are each self-centered. And this is causing an economic problem as explained before so to conclude um, a more dense space plus a good distribution equals to a better connection between 
uh, inhabitants. A dense space that, and plus a diverse space equals even more connection. A dense space plus centralized areas or centralization of the diverse elements equals to less connected areas overall and better connected locally, so among themselves. And the less dense and a better distribution would equal an average connected but more problematic, such as a car-oriented circulation. Less dense and center-based areas like equals in less connected overall and less connected locally among themselves, which equals to social and economic crisis. On the other hand, denser does not mean a compacted area. And this is another topic. I would like to stop here for the day. Um, because these kind of formulas we would reflect a lot on in the coming lecture in order to arrive to a new meaning of affordability and adequate housing overall and try to reflect it in, in Egypt. I will also present in the coming lecture um, some examples, uh, some studies um, which have been done on uh, 20 different case studies on, in Egypt, in, in Cairo. Uh, by students and uh, where they have proposed uh, also uh, some conclusions related to how to enhance the adequacy and affordability overall in the city. Uh, but keep these things in mind, go through it again. Uh, next lecture, I will go through it in a more deeper way. I will reflect on it more critically. Today, the aim was only to open up the uh, uh, the topic to housing and understand that uh, there are a lot of aspects and factors, principles, uh, characteristics related to, to housing. There are a lot of things to understand before going uh, uh, deeper to affordability. So if there are um, questions, I would like to stop here and take the questions. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, we can stop.
Okay, so uh, since there are no questions, uh, I think we can stop um, the lecture for the day. And uh, looking forward to meeting you again next week.